I went to school for architecture at Cornell University. I got a master's at uh, Columbia University for architecture and urban design, and then pursued a doctorate in city planning. So a lot of schooling in order to view the city as the canvas. So when you have an opportunity of growth and a metrics of growth that are looking at new forms of building and new typologies, but then what gets left behind are these other buildings and other spatial typologies. You have the industrial warehouse, you have the housing types, multifamily, single family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the south side, particularly of Chicago, where the work has gone away and there has been a particular level of investment, disinvestment, and ultimately you're left with empty lots as well. So challenges, what is a neighborhood? And what are the jobs within the neighborhood? And what is the education that actually allows you to get to the jobs and exposure for your future? So again, my, you know, so you're looking at this, this rise of STEM versus STEAM. Are familiar, people familiar with the, the phrases STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math? But STEAM is the next generation at science, technology, engineering, art, and math. We also do A plus, so art, agriculture, arts and design, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> we are actually merging Architect, artist, urban design, urban planner, farmer, and aquapon. Why farmer and what's an aquapon? Anybody familiar with aquaponics? Okay, we got some fish farmers in the room. So Sweetwater Foundation is the 501c3. Our tagline is there grows the neighborhood, very intentionally. So everybody's used to talking about there goes the hood. So we say there grows the neighborhood. And what we do is we married urban agriculture Aquaponics, art, and education for a, a concept of regenerative placemaking, just like seeds and plants, et cetera, et cetera. For real ecosystems, you plant the seed, you cultivate it, you, you, you raise a fish, you cultivate it, it spawns, and you have an abundance of life. So aquaponics, you feed the fish, they eat, they fertilize the water naturally. The water is pumped up based on the system design, goes to your plants that naturally, again, filter the water, to go back to the fish, because the nutrient water of the fish feeds the plants. So we have a diverse range of outcome and output. So you can have lettuce, basil, chard, arugula, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and a range of fish. You can have tilapia, perch, catfish. So several years ago, um, we had the challenge of pitching to MacArthur Foundation and Mozilla Foundation about how do we make this very interesting for youth so we said it's a digital media and learning component. So as you teach a student of any age, but we were particularly focusing on youth, but as you're teaching them the concept of water chemistry, they get a digital badge. Anybody familiar with this whole digital badge ecosystem that's happening? So um, you, Girl Scout, Boy Scouts, you do something, you receive a badge. You wear it on the sash. So MacArthur Mozilla Foundation and a bunch of networks of folks have said, why don't we take that into the 21st century and use something that they can badge on their phone or on their laptop? And it's a way of keeping accountability too. So like if I vouch for you and say, I'm going to give you one of my badges and you're on their portfolio, you can go into a resume with some of our folks. I mean, you can go to a job interview on your resume and I'm vouching for you. It keeps a, a, a tie in accountability. So. Uh, we game the system of aquaponics by thinking through. Well, you have to do well with fish, plants, and design. So we game that process. And we're putting it over time. Three months, six months, year, two years, five years. So we go from a junior level apprenticeship, senior level apprenticeship, journey mon, you travel. We've been sending students internationally uh, from the south side of Chicago. And you work towards the mastery. So what does that look like? They're actually building their portfolios of five gallon, 10 gallon, 20 gallon, 50 gallon, 1,000 gallon, 2,000 gallon, et cetera, et cetera. And everyone has an outcome that they can monitor, measure. And the next step is we're, we're actually starting to look at what those, what's the tech component of this? What's the real world monitoring of this ecosystem? So what are the apps you can program? What is the water chemistry? What are the water levels? What's the light? What's the intensity? Um, but your output is food. Now everybody knows what it costs to go to shop at a Whole Foods or a organic place, right? So we want to talk about market. We're actually creating new forms of markets within this existing rise of market within the local food network, right? Um, 
because the chefs want our product. That image is actually cropped, I'm not sure why. But that's an example of one of the sizes of scales. When you can grow 200 pounds of vegetables a week in an indoor or controlled environmental agriculture setting. Why is controlled environmental agriculture important? Why? Water. There's a scarcity of water, there are water control issues. What about the product of the, the quality of the food? We are always, predominantly, we are always in neighborhoods that don't have access to fresh, healthy food, which is also directly correlated to issues with diabetes, cancer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So instead, we create an ecosystem and a framework for conversations, an intergenerational, interdisciplinary conversation. And we had an event where we had somebody like a baby who was several months old to somebody that was 98 years old in the same event. It was a harvest celebration. Everybody had a good time. Um, we introduced the 3D modeling. So how do you do a 3D model of your thought of that thing? How do you use SketchUp? How do you use Inventor? How do you use all of this technology that is accessible in order to translate your idea into a product? How do you express that? So we started a, a network that has, has community partners, educators, employers, hobbyists, professionals, students, and universities and research. So I, I am the director of aquaponics on the south side of Chicago for Chicago State University, a predominantly black institution, but we're interfacing with the Harvards and the Yales. And I went to Columbia and Cornell, and so you know we have that network. And now there is an opportunity because the US Department of Agriculture and the US Department of Education have decided that they, they want to fund this to see what are the future careers and opportunities in this. Uh, we have a possibility for some serious collaboration and we're funding, uh, the funding supports interns and internships with our youth. So we, we're creating a mentorship program. The best part is we actually uh, are reaching out to the community. So once you do the research and development, the R&D side, then you make it sexy, right? You do the product that can be the installation that lives at a culinary school. Why? Because the marriage of art and cul culinary is the culinology and the art and science of food. You do the installation that lives in somebody's penthouse or a lobby of a hotel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're again, opening up other forms of markets. And now we are equipped with the skills to think and think through from the past, present, into the future. If you're given a building like that, that has the bones and the structure, and you're able to create a rendering for other folks to be able to see what the future of it is, it makes the sell and the pitch that much more compelling, right? So our model, this is chopped, but the theory for the transformation, the theory of change is we are reaching out, with the, particularly with the L3C that we have, we're reaching out to fix up and revitalize the housing in dilapidated neighborhoods. We're working, the folks that we feed and reach, and particularly youth, we put them through an urban agriculture experiential education program, so it's not just a talking head, you are actually physically doing something and you learn through osmosis by doing it and doing it again and doing it again, sharing it, teaching with others. Once we find the best of the best of that network, we say, we're gonna put you in front of a corporate responsibility group or so-and-so, as what, what pathway do you want to be? You want to buy a biologist, a theologist, an engineer? So we try a pilot program. We get the pilot program funded so that you attract the Whole Foods, you attract the Hyatts, you attract those other folks that want to employ these youth, the architecture firms. So we are part of this Cities of Learning. I don't know if everybody is familiar with this, the, the Cities of Learning. Oops, sorry. Cities of Learning is a national movement right now where it, learning doesn't just happen in the classroom, it happens everywhere. And this is echoed by the Clinton Global Initiative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? We're part of that. So what happens when you take that in a controlled classroom or a, in a controlled building setting and you actually do it out in public? Like seriously. So we started doing the revitalization of a, a, a site that used to be a school. It used to be a school and then the city tore it down because it was too much dilapidation and challenges. We took a two acre farm, I mean two acre site and turned it into a farm in the middle of a neighborhood that didn't have access to fresh and healthy food. But more importantly, we were reaching folks to have more folks come 
to be part of the conversation and to change the direction of the, the trajectory of the neighborhood. So we, we, we struck a deal with the city. We negotiated, um, negotiated a deal to get an empty, foreclosed, abandoned house that was frozen in the market since 2007. We're the first main tenants in this building. And we took that empty building and turned it into the Think Do House. We literally turned it into a canvas that becomes a beacon for people to say, what the hell is that? And people are like, why are you doing that in the middle of this neighborhood? Aren't you worried about tagging? Aren't you worried about this? We're like, no. Bring them in. So it was awesome because like when we were doing the, the mural, we had people stopping. We had people just posting up chairs. And then we had, it started off with the farm. People were getting food, learning about what was happening in the neighborhood. And we actually host workshops and outreach in that area. And then that attracts the ecosystem, much larger global ecosystem. That's my snapshot for the presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and start our fireside chat at this point. Um, just a little background on myself. My name is Mark Gautier. I'm a local company trying to address um, green issues through education and also with aquaponics. And I'm privileged tonight to be able to interview Mr. Emmanuel Pratt. So, um, well, <laughs> is anyone familiar with Opalaka? Okay, then. So, I came here earlier and then I had to cut out briefly because we're in conversation with uh, Dr. Willie Logan and the Opalaka CDC around this project of this art of transformation. And we're translating this into this other neighborhood. We're in, so how do you take an industrial building that in, infuse art and farming and aquaponics and community engagement and give that building some new life. So we're actually talking about them doing right now. Okay, beautiful. Um, so the title is Envisioning uh, Green Solutions to 21st Century Problems. We're basically looking at um, future issues we're anticipating with climate change and discussing some potential solutions or some angles that aquaponics can have on it. So uh, global warming is pretty much the primary issue that we're dealing um, going into the 21st century. Not so much focusing on the cause, but definitely having to address the effects. So um, first and foremost, we're talking about energy. Basically, the carbon dioxide emissions that are being produced are um, pretty much the primary cause of what we're dealing with. But going forward, uh, my question for you would be, um, to what degree could aquaponics offset agriculture as it exists so that it could potentially um, help cut down the cost of importing foods from different nations, driving it across the country to different areas? Okay, so um, do you all know where your lettuce comes from? The ground, but where geographically does your lettuce come from? So let's just take one particular, you want to grow it in an area that has a warmer climate. Arizona. <laughs> so now with aquaponics, yes. But in areas, what's the challenge of growing water? Two main issues. Water, I mean growing, growing, uh, growing water. That was the act of Freudian slip because you are literally growing a variation of water. And you're shipping water from California or wherever to Chicago, let's just take that in and of itself. What's happening in California? What's been happening in California? Drought. Have you watched the time lapse of the drought? It, I would encourage anybody to go watch this time lapse of this drought over the past several years, it's shocking. So if you have a situation where you're just dumping water out and you're only farming a particular way and you're not doing in a more controlled, efficient manner, we're getting to a point of crisis which is right in front of us that this could offset a lot of this. It, just, this is, it offsets the food miles, it offsets um, the quality control, because the second you cut a plant, for, this is basic science, right? You, you cut a plant from its root, what happens to the plant? It begins the dying process, which is actually a natural and a great thing. Instead, we're looking at how we could potentially infuse other chemicals in order to preserve it, which then, what, what the problem is that there's a correlation directly between the amount of pesticides and the cancer rates of what's happening to 
humans. So we can we could be more efficient and in linking that to the educational system and the jobs and the career pathways. And you're, so some kid can come in and say like, I wanna do something cool, experiment science. I mean, this, is, this is not anecdotal, this is real. I wanna do a cool science, science experiment. They do a small little aquaponic system, they engage their family, they win the science project, and then they decide they wanna either be an engineer or a chef. That's very real. Um, actually, it's funny you mentioned that because in my personal experience, um, just a little more background, 10 years with Miami-Dade County supervising curriculum, um, non-for-profits such as Common Threads come in and they're doing the cooking program to allow the kids to see what they can do with their foods. But more importantly, us having the climate that we hear in South Florida and our proximity to Central America, the Caribbean, there's no reason why we shouldn't have more manufacturing and definitely shorten that distance the food is traveling in order to provide these people with foods. No, absolutely. And then with this climate, you guys have an abundance of light. You got an abundance of t the temperature is great for growing some stuff. You wouldn't grow in Chicago where I just left this morning and it was like five inches of snow. So um, I'm still in shock. I'm melting. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, so going forward, uh, talking about the pesticides and fertilizers that are being used in the foods, and um, I guess how they're using that as approach to offset some of the conditions that they're having, um, fighting off the different insects as they become immune to the fertilizers they already have. I'm sorry, the pesticides they already have, and trying to use fertilizers to basically accommodate for the loss of production that they're getting with climate change. Yeah, so like places, I mean, operations such as hydroponics or aquaponics are gaining interest and attention from the USDA because it is a controlled, again, a controlled environmental agriculture. When you're saying controlled, it's you're controlling for your temperatures, you're controlling for your waters, you're controlling for your inputs and maximizing your outputs. Uh, for those who don't know what aquaponics is, you feed the fish, they eat, they fertilize the water. This water is pumped directly to the, the, the plants and the plants filter the good nutrients out of the water to go to right back to the fish. It's a recirculating water ecosystem, and when you do it right, you just you continue just to top off the water. You maximize your water, you maximize your outputs of, of your plants, uh, of your vegetables, and the beauty of it also is you're maximizing whatever natural light, and you're not, you're not introducing um, these pesticides, herbicides, or whatever that you have to worry about later, and, control. Yeah. So above and beyond just controlling, there's um, claims that I guess the food is uh, more nutritious, that it grows faster, it uses anywhere from 80 to 90 percent um, less water. In your experience, like how accurate is that information? I mean, it's extremely accurate. Um, because it is recirculating, we monitor it. So, and it's a great teaching opportunity too. What is evaporation? What is condensation? What is transpiration? What are these, t what are these terms that we throw around that most people don't really think about. So, and what's interesting is like the transpiration process of a, of a tomato and a tomato plant is far different than watercress or far different than basil. And what, you know, how do you maximize your yield off of a basil? If you grow basil, it grows straight up. If you don't know how to hard harvest that basil, it'll keep growing up, growing up. If you actually know how to harvest it, you snip it, it grows into, it doubles. You snip it again, it grows and it grows. So then all of a sudden you have a plant that has like a three month life cycle that you're harvesting, 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 cultivating it, and then you're making 3.99 for a quarter of an ounce, or you're making recipes, value added, value added you know, a pesto sauce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, with it being a more of a controlled environment also, you're maximizing your output, you're minimizing your inputs, you are diversifying your crops in a, a smaller footprint, and you're not really having to worry about the temperature variations and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, like which will actually impact your crops. So I had, a, I had a, a, an example. South side of Chicago, it was 45 below with wind chill. It hit this nexus point, which is this crazy thing where like, negative 40 is the exact same thing as negative, negative 40 Fahrenheit is the same as negative 40 Celsius. Like, that's a weird anomaly to me. And to go through and live through that, but then I'm in this building and we're producing like crazy. And it, 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 it's, it just proves, yes, it works and it's, it's efficient. It's funny, because I've watched um, one of your 
talks, I think it was, I believe it was one of the TED Talks, and he mentioned Will Allen and the work he's doing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Right. And rather than doing an indoor system, he's using other eco-friendly practices, such as the composting, yep. to go ahead and maintain that temperature during the wintertime so that you can have that, you know, 365 a year type production. So everybody familiar with the energy component of composting? Everybody knows what composting is. Taking waste from restaurants, you take your, your nitrogen sources and your carbon sources and you pile it up and then all of a sudden it cooks. What's interesting is that if you add your worms and your beneficial bacteria that form into it, a pile of compost can generate up to 150 degrees internal heat. So if your food scraps is creating this heat and you're also taking care of your waste that would otherwise end up in a landfill, or if you're taking plastics that would otherwise end up in the Pacific Ocean that's killing off our eco I mean, we're talking ecosystem. I heard the term all over and over today. But this is really addressing the issue of ecosystems, and particularly within our neighborhoods. What does it take, in order, what does it take for a neighborhood to thrive? A neighborhood is an ecosystem. So what does it take for a neighborhood to thrive? What do you need for it to thrive? Hmm? Food? Yes? Money? So what we're doing is addressing all of these pieces. We look, we're how, where's your food source? How do you keep people fed and happy? How do you keep people in, exposed to new forms of opportunities? How do you revitalize the dilapidated structures? How do you show that there's another way to build up the community instead of just tearing it down? I mean, in addition to that, I mean, maintaining the resources, looking at how your water use is being used, um, making it efficient so that, you know, as, you know, the climate change goes uh, goes ahead forward and water becomes more of, an, more of an issue, you're doing future planning as far as how to be used to work on your other resources. And the other thing is that our building typologies, if anybody's into architecture, our buildings is a lot of talk about lead and, and, and energy efficiency. And there are more and more softwares that are going out to model what are the energy, energy efficiency and capacity of these buildings in order to save your money over periods of time? How do you introduce solar? How do you introduce solar water heating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? We're learning from the adaptive repurposing of some of these older buildings and what you don't want to do again, and you can do a new form of a ground up model that is much more energy efficient, much more water conscious, much more productive. Excellent. Uh, we've pretty much talked about the crop failures. Well, actually, um, to what degree do you feel that um, aquaponics could help some of these areas where agriculture is an issue? For example, myself, uh, my background, my parents were born in Haiti, so after the right. earthquake and everything in 2010, food production and how they were going to accommodate the needs of all these displaced people became an issue. So how do you foresee aquaponics potentially helping out areas like that, areas in Africa where there's a shortage of food? There's actually a, a, a really big push right now in Haiti, um, and the Clinton Global Initiative and other folks have been looking at what new economies can you bring into that into that 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 country, into Port-au-Prince and what area um, that could revitalize areas that are totally shocked and rocked and disinvested. So you they want to marry the education to this other food production, but it also opens an opportunity for Haiti to be producing certain things that are just uniquely in Haiti. Absolutely. And then it's open, again opens a new market. Um, there are there are aquaponics operations that are emerging right now in Haiti. Um, and they're because of the magic of the internet, they're sharing their information across to Mumbai and Shanghai, and, and so everybody's starting to see like, okay, well, there are special things that you can grow under certain types of conditions that you never thought about. You can grow orchids in aquaponics. You don't have to just grow only food, you can grow a, a wide range of crops. Yep. Okay. Uh, addressing water, we spoke about this. Um, Everyone always talks about the organic plants and the vegetables that you grow with aquaponics, but we don't really we would talk about um, how the people can benefit of the proteins from the tilapia, the perch, and other type of fishes that are um, raised in the aquaponic system. I guess this would be a two-part. Um, to what degree are you able to introduce that clean tilapia back into the market? And with the reputation that tilapia has gotten recently, as far as being as bad as bacon and whatever, how and does... the chicken and fish. Exactly. How does... Um, aquaculture compared to aquaponics in that regard? So um, 
aquaculture, a lot of folks were starting to produce, just overproduce fish in very small areas. And the challenge that be became very visible was what do you do with all this wastewater? If you have a whole lot of effluent rich water, what do you do with that stuff? Um, or what conditions are you even raising them in right. to begin with? So um, it, 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 is, it has become very public that uh, over cramming fish leads to a very, very bad production cycle, uh, way too much waste, and then what do you do with it? Sometimes folks were just flushing it, and if you flush the waste, the wastewater just goes back into our, our streams, and, and that's problematic in and of itself. But the aquaculture industry was uh, recognizing that, starting looking at all the different ways to in, in, include uh, technology and other forms to filter the water. But the thing that's nice about the aquaponics piece is that it begins a challenge, a very visibly upfront challenge. Uh, what are you doing with this wastewater and why if this wastewater is fertilized water, what are the other markets that you can do with this? You know, so, so Home Depot and some other places are selling fish water. Right, so here's another market opportunity. Right, it's fertilized water. If you know what to do with it, um, so the 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 over cramming and under in the, the tilapia are very resilient fish, and so it's it's been it's been exposed that there there's there's problems with the way that certain countries have been producing their their uh, fish just for profit. Um, whereas now we're starting to see that you can you can change the way you produce. It's shifting the perception of this being a, just a terrible fish, a, you know, the bottom of the barrel fish. So now we're actually starting to work with restaurants directly. The restaurants come, they see, they do a taste test, a, a comparison, and then they say, I want this amount. Which is great for the students that are involved in it, because then now you're talking math. What do you, how are you accountable? What, how, many, how many pounds, how many fish at three pounds what size are they? How much can you fulfill an order? How often? I mean, it's a very, very challenging mathematics problem uh, that we can set up into a spreadsheet and start creating formulas for. Beautiful. As much as I would love to get into the details of the educational component, because that's you know future manufacturing jobs, yeah. future occupation for our students. We are running a little bit low. Yeah. So um, I actually wanted to ask you about your particular area of expertise and how does aquaponics um, do you see as far as urban planning and addressing issues that a particular community might have what type of solutions would aquaponics be able to offer from there um, so what I've experienced in the past uh, five years now wow it's going on six is that it is it is an economic revitalization opportunity um, you you do a demonstration project that's totally different totally new uh, it opens up a market. You started training some folks to place them into different career pathways, and then all of a sudden you get this entrepreneurial spark that you recognize from some of these folks. And it's not just the youth. It's, it's folks that are carpenters, plumbers, electricians, et cetera, that live in the neighborhood to say, I have that skill set, and they recognize themselves in the project. So what's interesting is that uh, is everybody familiar with what's happening with Whole Foods? And the, they have a Whole Kids Foundation now, which focuses on education. They give grants around gardens and aquaponics and some other. But they also have a Whole Cities Foundation now because they're realizing that they're going to start looking how to rebuild and how to invest in some of these neighborhoods that they're, they're going into to uh, open new stores. So it just so happens that three minutes away from where we have our farm in the neighborhood, a Whole Foods is opening up. It's the first ever that I know of in a economically devastated neighborhood. Um, also, uh, oh, perhaps Obama's library. So th th this 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 conversation around economic opportunities becomes very 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 real. And then we have international tourists that show up all the time. People from Paris, London, et cetera, et cetera. They hear about this cool thing, and they know that. There's, there's something like that happening in their neighborhood, Johannesburg. We had visitors. And then so now all of a sudden, you have this student from the south side of Chicago that is offering a tour to the world, literally. And that's just an amazing opportunity for, for the growth of a neighborhood. Beautiful. Hopefully, that's something that we can duplicate here in Miami, you know, going oh, forward. Oh, it's already happening. 
Well, it is definitely why for it. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing it. You're helping lead the card. You're Thank to you. Lead the charge. Um, so uh, going forward, we're opening the platform to any questions from the audience um, as far as aquaponics, uh, green solutions to our 21st century problems. Is anybody juice? So we, we have time for two questions. Okay. Just curious. Oh, oh, go ahead. Excellent. Uh, well, I was just asking about the juicing because we didn't really talk about that, but um, that's a, a nutritional and a, a great way to drink your product, but also a um, new market. Yeah. No, actually, it's something I incorporated uh, maybe two years ago. And like you were saying about the vegetables being fresh coming out of the aquaponics and being able to get that nutrition directly from the juicing is beautiful. You had a question? Hi, yes. My name is Eunice Kofi. I am... Uh chemist um, and entrepreneur. So y your story is just very interesting because that's how I got started in science. My dad mm -hmm. taught me how to grow corn mm -hmm. and I entered my first science fair and I won. So that, you know, led to me uh, being where I am today. Um, I wanted to know, you, you're thinking about starting one here in Miami, would you be interested in starting in other sites? Because I know that in uh, Tallahassee, where I'm from, Florida A&M's uh, School of Business is interested in doing something with hydroponics and looking at that as a source of um, income for um, the African American community. And then also we have a very strong agriculture school. So we have, um, uh, farms where we allow community members to go and farm, um, plant their own foods, and then we also have viticulture. One of the only viticulturalists um, in America is at Florida A&M, and so we um, create our own wines. We are trying to find ways to maintain the muscadine grape. Wow. Um, so I just wanted to know if there was any interest in expanding and seeing how I could possibly connect you with someone at Florida and m too. Yeah, very much so. Um, and so we had a visit from the Deputy Secretary for the USDA, Krista Harden, and she says specifically the, US, the USDA has been looking, how do you attract up-and-coming future farmers? Because they have a, a crisis on who's farming. And so when you're looking at urban agriculture, you're looking at, again, a new market, an opportunity. But it's interesting because we're not branding it as an urban farmer per se. We're like, you're an architect, but you're also a farmer. You're a plumber, you're also a farmer. You're a basketball player, football player, but you're also a farmer. So an urban condition. But she says specifically, if you find a way, they're looking for ways to bridge the rural and urban and also the transfer of this technology and knowledge. So the USD is very, very, very interested in seeing um, research, education, and economics. So. Long story short, yes, absolutely. And if you want to find out, if you want to reach me, just info at sweetwaterfoundation.com, and I'll, I'll talk to you after. All right. Excellent. Any other questions? Yeah, right Go ahead. You mentioned about engaging families with trying to start the whole program in the communities. Humans, as human beings, we tend to have short attention spans. How do you kind of keep them engaged? Because one of the things that tend to happen with community farms is that unless there's some sort of program with it, the crops die, people stop coming, right. they don't really tend to it. So how, what's been successful for you? So for one, we do it within the neighborhood. We find folks within the neighborhood. So inside, out, not outside, in. Right? We talk to folks directly from the neighborhood, find folks that buy in from the neighborhood, and we find folks that will help cultivate it. For two, we have created a programming that has a structure that we call, we, we, we do harvest celebrations. So not just uh, food, but how do you bring in an audience to celebrate the folks that have seen this thing through? You get some music, you get some food, you get some sounds, and you have the students, or whoever they are, present. So they're actually taking ownership every step of the way and taking the leadership role, and then all of a sudden we're starting to see this sustained network. Um, and then you bring in that international person that shows up and you're like, what's your story? And then, the, you know, information is exchanged and then new, new horizons are, are, are envisioned, right? So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very, very, very forced uh, feedback loop within the ecosystem. Well, I can say in particular my experience, um, we've been doing the aquaponics projects in Liberty City, working with different elementary schools, and the buy-in really came in from um, building those relationships with the principals and the stakeholders um, from the school side. 
what that did is that enabled us to go ahead and address some of their needs that they had with STEM and projects and exposing the children to science. And at the same time, working through the schools, these are literally community hubs within some of those neighborhoods. So it was a lot easier to bring in other non-for-profits, other you know, interested parties, and especially the families. Far too often, there's no feedback. So you have somebody does a little foreign project, it, it looks good for a second, there's no real conversation about how, what is the ownership internally? Where are the carpenters, where are the plumbers, where's the scientists, where's all this stuff, how often are we eating, who's the cook? You start the conversation with that and you keep that conversation rolling. Absolutely.